Look at this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the crowd favorite, historic Trans Am. One of my favorites, too, because working in the Trans Am series presented by Pirelli currently, me and Scott and Jonathan all do that, and this is the Genesis. And this car right here had a lot to do with the careers of Roy Woods and Roger Penske. This is the, we'll call it the George Fulmer, but you would have seen Peter Revson, I believe Tony Adamowitz driving this. This is Ken Epsman. 1972 AMC Javelin. Before they went out, he told me a funny story that that was a Penske Roy Woods Javelin. But if any of the Penske's went down, Penske had the right to go take that car and use it as a Penske car. And speaking of Penske, the car right behind this beautiful Javelin, look at this, follow me to Sears Point, Roy Woods. Now, these are the actual cars that raced in the Trans Am series from 1966 to 1972. These are not reproductions. These are the cars. So that is a real Penske Mark Donahue Camaro there, driven by Bill Ockerlund. So much history in this field, so much history in these cars. That's Jim Halsey there driving the Dan Fury. 1970 Ford Mustang Boss 302, and Fury still races with us in SBRA. Was with us last year in Mid-Ohio. Super cool. Then right behind him is Scott Joy, 23 years old, but has been driving for more than half of his life. His father, Mike Joy, who I consider, no offense, gentlemen, <laughs> the best broadcaster in motorsports. I just always love Mike Joy, even the Meekum auctions, the stuff that he can pull out. But that's Scott Joy, 1970, of Walter Perkins, Chevrolet Camaro. This is a very famous car, built by Herb Adams, driven by Bob Tullius. This car should not be a race car. I don't know who looked at this and said, let's make that a road racing car, but it was a great car, the 1964 Pontiac Tempest GTO. Then there's Ike Keeler in the Bill Pendleton Mercury Cougar. Ike Keeler, his father probably created that door handle right there. His father made all the hardware for Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln back in the day. Jim Haig, always one of our fastest drivers in that Jim Whelan notchback. That's the car I'm used to seeing Mike Joy driving. There's Tony Perella out there flexing for us. These are the cars that got him into the Trans Am Series. These cars would have been racing here when he saw the series in 1968, where he became addicted to Trans Am and now owns the Trans Am Series. Tom Forgione, and that's Steve Ross. Beautiful car, look at this here. That's the Rick Jeffrey car, giving us thumbs up. He was who was in that Protofab car in our oh, Group okay. 10 race that we couldn't figure out the name. That's Rick Jeffrey there, giving us that one. Number one, look at the fit and finish on these cars. A lot of them hand painted just like they were back in the day. A little salute there. I love it. See a lot of them with the AS on the side. That was a sedan. That's where the uh, Trans Am series came from. Yep. The SCCA oh. Club Racing A sedan. He's too cool for school right there. <laughs> I think that was uh, Brian Farron. We saw John Romano, and here they're coming out, getting split. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching on Speed Tour TV, we've got somebody tuning in from Austria. Well, then, put another shrimp on the barbie. That's from Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> get on Speed Tour TV. Leave a call. It's the end of the day. I'm getting a little bit hairy, but there he goes, the professional Mike Joy. And in this car right here, the 1968 championship Donahue car, the car that really put Penske and Mark Donahue on the map in motorsports, they won 10 of 13 races. It's a miracle to finish 10 of 13 races. They won 10 of 13 races in there. There's the Jerry uh, Thompson car right there of Mike Joy. Beautiful that, car. That is uh, the Owens Corning fiberglass team. We, we're not very far from Corning. That uh, car was put together by spare parts in the Chevrolet Corvette and Camaro. Uh, club racing, very successful Owens Corning glass fiber, fiberglass team. Yeah, I always think of the Owens Corning cars as the Corvettes, but right. I guess predating that was well, the Mike Joy car here at Jerry Thompson. Well, actually, it was the other way around. The Corvettes the, is the, the way that they got into Trans Am racing. They had the club racing Corvettes before they had this. Okay. But uh, the car was delivered late. It was a body in white, and they uh, just 
took parts, whatever they could find from the Camaros and Corvettes that they had in their shop. But uh, being that we're very not very far from uh, Corning, New York, just had to bring that up. I love it. Check that out. We've got Croatia, Alan Bat watching here. This is so much fun. Group six is next. Margaret, I can't say your last name, Margaret, but group six is next. So don't you worry. Stay tuned because this is basically the real group six here. But these cars are prepared exactly as they were 1966 to 1972. The actual cars that would have raced in the Trans Am series. That's what makes them eligible. In fact, Jim Haig is racing a car that only competed in one Trans Am race. But because it did back in the day and is set up per the rules, he can race in that notchback Mustang. Now, they're taking the short course for the pace laps to cut time, but in the race, they are going to be taking the long course through the boot, and this is such a blast to watch. Bill Ockerlin, Ken Epsman up front. Let's see what happens. Jim Halsey's always up there in the front. Scott Joy, I haven't watched him race in historic Trans Am, but everybody says a really good racer. You can remember uh, a few years ago at Laguna Seca, Tommy Dreesey won the race in Vic Elford's car. We just showed the Vic Elford winning race here in 1970 on the SVRA Facebook page. After this race, you can check that out. But a lot of these cars were in that race as the lights go off in the pace car. We've got a Javelin versus a Camaro up front. Let's see what happens. I love how they bunch up their starts two by two, take a late green. Historic Trans Am puts on such a fantastic race and makes such great noise right here when they hit the loud pedal. Green, 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 here we go. Drag race between Bill Ockerlin and that Mark Donahue Camaro and Ken Epsman in that Roy Woods, George Fulmer. Looks like Bill Ockerlin takes a little bit of the advantage going into turn one as we look at Ike Keeler side by side with Hildebrandt. Still side by side. Look at this two by two. We haven't seen this yet all weekend as they come up the uphill S's. How about that, Scott? That was fascinating. And it, it's uh, strange that we think of this as a George Fulmer car. Actually, Peter Revson was supposed to drive that car in 1971 at the last race of the season, but he had a scheduling conflict. So Fulmer climbed in, won the pole, won the race, and was signed for the next year. Wound up winning the championship with uh, Roy Woods Racing, which became the factory team for Javelin. It was a two-car team with Roy Woods and George Fulmer. Look at that. Bill Ockerlin takes the advantage going into Big Machine Vodka's Spike Cooler's bus stop turn. I wonder if Peter Revson's conflict was Formula One. Not uh, sure, but here they come in. Down the carousel, you can really see the body roll of these cars. And like I said, no modern technology. These cars are set up as they were, so they roll and jive like they did back in the day. And they're still two by two as they come down here, about to enter what we call the laces of the boot. And Scott Joy keeping right up there with Jim Halsey just ahead of him and Hildebrandt just to the side of him. Oh, gentlemen, I don't suggest going two by two <laughs> into the toe of the boot. Be careful. And uh, that is a lot more cambered than the camera shows there, that turn, but still a very treacherous turn. As Some of them are still two by two here at historic Trans Am at the Hilliard U.S. Vintage Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. How about that? How about that? That Camaro is uh, 330 horsepower. Uh, it is a 430 horsepower, rather, 303 uh, cubic inch engine in it. And it was the reason that the, the Boss 302 came about. They were worried about the short block Chevrolet Camaro engine at the end of the 1967 season when uh, it was uh, Camaro started to win. So they stole two engineers from General Motors. They went to work and produced the Ford Boss 302 named for the 302 cubic inch engine in it. And of course, they went on to win another championship in 1970, Ford did. These championships were kind of uh, very evenly spread. Ford winning three manufacturer championships, 66, 67, and 70. And then it was uh, American Motors that won with the Javelin in 71 and 72. And then Chevrolet Camaro, mostly with uh, Mark Donahue and Roger Penske winning the other two of, of this particular era. Well, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Right at the start-finish line, we had a pass for the lead. Kenny Epsman in that AMC Javelin that would have been a Revson, Fulmer, a Domowitz car from 1972, taking the lead over Bill Ockerland in that Donahue Camaro. And I didn't get a close look, but I think that's one of those famous Camaros with the uh, fabric top. Is that right, Scott? Yes, that is correct. Now, uh, what's the, the, 
What does that mean? I think Penske got away with a little bit there. Well, you know, less weight is more speed. Uh, a lot of these cars uh, were famous for being in the acid bath or acid dipping, as it was called back in the, in the day. And, uh, of course, uh, anything that, uh, you know, Penske could get away with, he did. And Mark Donahue was, was his driver. So Penske was, was very, very good at the kind of uh, bending the rules, so we say. <laughs> and that's dipping acid, not dropping yes. acid. <laughs> that would have been another thing that the people in this era would have done. As we look at Scott Joy, man, keep an at it. But that Hildebrandt car, that Pontiac Tempest GTO of Herb Adams and Bob Tullia, seriously, that looks like a mob car where they could put like six bodies in the trunk, making that a race car. And then fast as it was is just absolutely crazy to me. Yeah, daily driver made into a race car. The yeah, because that's, that's for getting groceries. Yes. The Ike Keeler Ford uh, Lincoln Mercury Cougar. Lincoln Mercury, the only time that it had factory backing was in the 67 season and it lost the manufacturer's championship by two points. But this particular car was bought, uh, cut off the uh, showroom floor. The manager was convinced by his engineer uh, and salesman that they should take the car and make it a, uh, a race car. So they did. What they didn't know was that the salesman had car craft engineering as part of, of his background. Oh, and wow. He had, and he had worked on the car craft engines along with Lee Dykstra. <clears throat> so they took this car. When Lincoln Mercury was getting towards the end of the season, they were worried about maybe losing the championship. So what they did was they ship, secretly shipped the body and uh, chassis over to the uh, Lincoln Mercury uh, dealership, which became the semi-factory effort for Lincoln Mercury. And that car was used to hopefully help Lincoln Mercury win the championship, which unfortunately they lost by only two points. Wow. And was that the Dan Gurney, Parnelli Jones era of uh, the Cougars? Yeah, well, Budmore Engineering had the three factory Cougars. And that was what they were uh, normally winning their points with, but they were concerned about the third car. Uh, it's taking the lead too. Ike Keeler in that Cougar now taking the lead over Jim Haig. We've had a lot of changes happening here, followed by Dan Fury, Bill Ockerland, Hildebrandt. There's Ken Epsman there. A lot of changes here. That's what I love about historic Trans Am staying so close together. But don't count out Ken Epsman. Ken Epsman seems to kind of fall back sometimes, waits for the car to come to him or maybe the tires and then takes off like a rocket ship. There's the number 37 there of John Romano. Yeah, two of the cars that I don't see out here, uh, my favorite is the Dodge Challenger and you could be able to see that, this lime green with a black hood, the uh, ex Posey uh, factory Dodge. And the other car that's not out here, that at least that I didn't see go by, was the number one. And I bring that up because in 1966 was the first uh, Trans-American Sedan Championship race, which is what it was known as back then. The, that number one Ford Mustang, which is here, was the first car ever entered in the first ever Trans Am race. And that's why it has the number one. It was issued that to signify that. Well, that's the 1A. That's not it, right? You're talking about the silver one? Uh, yes. And then also Ken Adams, the Reventlow Mustang, isn't entered in. So we're, rich, we're missing Richard Goldsmith and Ken Adams. The Dan Gurney Cougar is here on display, but not out there racing right now. But we got to get back to this race because it is really heated up. <laughs> the scoreboard on your left can't even keep up with all of the changes that are happening. And it looks like Dan, F I'm calling him Dan Fury, but Jim Halsey in the Dan Fury car maybe taking the lead as Ken Epsman moves up on Scott Joy. I can't even keep up, but these campers here to your right are having just a blast watching this. That uh, orange Camaro there, I believe that's the Warren Agor car of Dennis Singleton. Agor, I believe, I'm not sure. Agor. Beautiful car up front. What's the pronunciation? Warren Agor. That's one of the A sedan cars that uh, Warren Agor actually won the A sedan national championship with. See, I love having all this knowledge right here, sitting right next to me. It's beautiful. Some great images. There's Mike Joy there. And that Jerry Thompson Camaro. Look at these cars. Listen to that sound. There's the Warren Ager car. He did the downtown parade with us at Watkins Glen. You can see their hands moving. I just absolutely love how much they're having to fight each and every turn with these cars. Way too much power with very little handling and almost no brakes. Yeah, you know, the, what could go wrong? Yeah, no, what could go wrong? Uh, the, uh, we were talking about on the, uh, the PA 
over uh, at, here at Watkins Glen, that you look inside these cars, these steering wheels are the size of some of today's tires. They're not the, you know, the pristine and precise steering mechanisms. And you slide these cars to where you want them to turn. You don't actually turn them. And the gearboxes, you don't just gingerly paddle shift. You slam these gears in because that's what you had to do at the time. Yep. And we had great shots there of the Mike Joy car. And it's so cool to have Mike Joy here joining us. Huge, you know, he, he works in racing and then he spends his vacation out here racing. But one of the things that I got to say, like, sometimes you don't want to meet your heroes, but meeting Mike Joy has made me like Mike Joy even more. I mean, he is an absolute, pardon the term, joy to talk to. And we were talking earlier in the trunk, he's got this like one vent that comes out of the fuel cell, but then it comes out when two hoses. And I was asking him what that is, and he's like, you know what? I don't know what that is. <laughs> and it's very tough to stump Mike Joy. <laughs> it is. Some of the uh, historic years in uh, Trans Am was 1968. That was the only year that the 12 hours of Sebring and the 24 hours of Daytona were included in the Trans Am Championship. Ben, can you imagine trying to wrestle these cars around for either 12 or 24 hours? You had, had to be absolutely exhausted after that. Yeah, if we went to our current Trans Am drivers now and said oh, we're joining them, they would <laughs> Maybe revolt. Throw at you. I mean, they would burn <laughs> us down. Look at this Ike Keeler going into the heel of the boot, followed by Hildebrandt, followed by Halsey, followed by Ken Epsman, then Bill Ockerlin coming up right beside Ken Epsman, two of the most historic cars out there right now. I love that Tom McIntyre is out there also in that 68 championship winning car. And then there's Jim Haig. So watch for Jim Haig and Bill Ockerland and Kenny Epsman. If they work together, they might be able to catch these top two or three here. And again, you know, we, we can't overemphasize enough. These are the original cars with the original parts in them. The only thing that is uh, not necessarily original are the tires. The only reason that they have a spec tire is to kind of level the playing field because you have such a disparity in the years and the development of the cars. But other than that, these are the original cars. These are not replicas. These are not cars that have ma remanufactured parts. These are the original cars. I really appreciate that Hildebrandt is wearing white gloves <laughs> so we can see what his hands are doing as we see what I think is maybe the sixth lead change of this race. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, just like Trans Am back in the day, we have another lead change here at Watkins Glen International. And those lead changes were very important back in the day. Uh, this uh, was the original win on Sunday, sell on Monday concept. And if you want to race on Sunday, the uh, showroom would have a picture of that race win up in the uh, showroom uh, display floor. And of course, if you won the manufacturer's championship, you could tout that all year long. And that's why these manufacturers were so adamant and they recruited such great drivers was because this was all about selling cars. This was all about using racing as a way to sell cars. Just heard from our producers that up front, John Hildebrandt in the biggest car in the field is a second a lap faster than the rest of the field. How incredible is that? So Herb Adams must know something that I don't. And again, that is a daily driver that was used to go and you know, get groceries back and forth. And <clears throat> he looked at it and said, you know what? I, I really want to go Trans Am racing, but I don't want to do any factory thing. I can't really afford a, a big car. How about this car? <laughs> and so, lo and behold, they developed it into a, a Trans Am car. And but as you can see, it's very competitive. In fact, it won. Oh, but they're catching them. Look yeah. at this. They're going three, almost three wide into the heel of the boot. I believe that's Bill Ockerland there. Yes. That, no, no, Bill's oh. back there. Is that Haig? Who is, no, it's Ike Keeler. Ike Keeler again. Ike Keeler takes back the lead. The then Halsey, then Ockerland, then Hildebrandt, Jim Haig, Ken Epsman side by side. Look at this. Another lead change here as we look at Bill Ockerland in that vinyl topped Camaro because I know that the tech guys leaned on it at one point and it just dipped in. The stories and the cheating that happened back in Trans Am in those days are absolutely legendary. Yeah, that was on the, the Sam Posey Dodge Challenger that they had actually been able to get it through tech and the uh, tech official leaned on the you know, top of the, the roof and it caved in, almost caved in, dimpled so badly that they didn't pass it. They had to go down to a downtown Dodge dealership, cut off a roof to, on one of the show models and put it on that car to get it to pass. Side by side, Mustang and Cougar. Ooh, Ike Keeler kind of cutting off Halsey there. Way to go Halsey for, for seeing it happen. But Ike Keeler getting a little bit of aggressive. And there's Halsey in that Dan Fury car. Side by side, up the uphill S's. Mercury Cougar versus Ford Mustang, followed by that Donahue Penske Camaro. 
and then like, that Pontiac Tempest. Just like back in the day, we have Mercury, a, a Ford Boss 302, and a Chevy Camaro, a manufacturer's these different ones up in the top. Halsey keeps showing the nose to Keeler, but Keeler just will not relent. No, but Halsey's got it this time. Coming into the Big Machine Vodka Spike Coolers, it's Halsey followed by that Mark Donahue, Bill Ockerlin, Camaro really showing us how much lean he's got. I love those gold wheels on that Camaro. And Keeler, who was leading at the line, I believe he now is, what, third? And look at the angle of that rear wing there on that Boss 302. That's a, that's a big angle. He's trying to get as much downforce as he can. As look at that. There's a little bit of side-by-side -side action happening in the back. So final lap here, half a lap left, and it looks like we've got, from my naked eye, Halsey, followed by Bill Ockerlin, followed by Ike Keeler, followed by Ken Epsman, John Hildebrandt. I think that's Jim Haig there in that notchback Mustang. Can't really tell. But what another race here. Historic Trans Am seems to never disappoint at Watkins Glen International Raceway. Well, they put on a great show. And just like back in the day, different manufacturers up in the uh, top five. Yeah, we've got five different manufacturers in the top five. Exactly. We've got Ford, Chevy, Mercury, AMC, and Pontiac. But there like isn't that. any racing today, modern racing, yeah. where there's five different manufacturers racing in the top five. And just like back in 1970, that was the only year that all the factory uh, cars were in, all the uh, manufacturers had factory-backed efforts. All right, here we go. Jim Halsey could take it here for Ford. We might be selling some more Mustangs on Monday, right? That's exactly. Jim Halsey, but no, Bill Ockham is trying to come at him. Let's see. Checkered flag is out. Was it Ford or Chevy? I can't tell. I'm not sure they know. It looks <laughs> like by .096, it looks like Halsey won. Wow. Car Jim Halsey won by .09, what is that? Is that nine? 96 one thousandths of a second. 96 one thousandths, that's like, no, no. It's like that quick. Unbelievable. And, and, and you, you have to know that the closest race ever in Trans Am history was decided by three feet between Farnelli Jones and a similar Ford Boss 302. And I believe it was a Chevrolet Camaro that was uh, second. They were separated by three feet after four and a half hours of racing. So uh, just like back in the day, a very, very close finish. Great driving. Unbelievable. My heart is pounding <laughs> as we show some results here. Unbelievable. Jim Halsey. Mr. Fury, I hope you're watching this. Jim Halsey doing your car proud, your history, because Fury's still an SVRA racer. Jim Halsey winning, as we said, by such a small margin, followed by Bill Ockerland in that Penske Camaro of Mark Donahue. Ike Keeler out there on the podium. Nice job, Ike Keeler, followed by John Hildebrandt, who had the fastest lap, I believe, and had the uh, lead for a while as Ken Epsman. Jim Haig is sixth, Tom Forgione in seventh, Jim Glass in eighth, Rick Jeffrey ninth, and John Romano round out our top 10. What a fantastic race. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out here with Historic Trans Am. Awesome race. I'm gonna take a little bit of a break, ladies and gentlemen. I gotta catch my breath. We're gonna show to some of our commercials and marketing partners, but stay tuned for group six and group 12 here at Watkins Glen International. There is less than one hundredth of an inch of motor oil protecting your car's engine. Friction and heat causes engine oil to experience thermal breakdown, weakening its ability to protect the engine and its parts. Lucas Heavy Duty Oil Stabilizer is specially formulated to resist thermal breakdown, protect vital engine parts, and extend the life of your engine. It also stops smoking, knocking, and oil consumption in worn engines. Lucas Heavy Duty Oil Stabilizer. Keep that engine alive. 